This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. We must cooperate. Believing is a simple act of faith. This is what this chapter is dedicated to. Simple faith in God's promise after salvation to deliver us, to, to set us on high, to give us authority over Satan. And so when she finally believed his promise and counted him faithful to perform the promise, this is what changed her around and will change us around too. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome back to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. Good to have you here. You know, we are in the series on the heroes of faith. And Hebrews chapter 11, this is number five in the series. I know that you're going to be blessed today by the Word of God. And I've been offering all this time my uh, flash drive on the heroes of faith. I know it's going to be a great blessing, but I've also got a whole book on it. And not just heroes of faith, but actually the New Testament book of Hebrews, which tells us again the great transition from the old covenant into the new and how we have a better covenant established on better promises. And what I'm teaching here is found on the flash drive, of course, but it's also found within the book. And so if you want to, you're suddenly get a hunger for the book of of uh, Hebrews, and I know that's going to be a great blessing for you too. So when they come on here at halftime, they can tell you how you can have a copy and you'll be blessed by it. So far in this series, we have taken up again. The subject is here is not faith for salvation. In fact, this, the promises starting out in this particular chapter says, from the Old Testament, also quoted in the book of Romans, that is the just shall live by faith. In other words, those justified or saved by faith now continue to live by faith. And that's what we're dealing with. Hebrews chapter 11 is an entire chapter on the walk of faith after you become a believer. Because faith in your heart, God can see that. But this is what is talked about in the book of James. When James talked about the fact that not only did faith save them, but faith also saved them in front of people. You're saved in front of God by faith in your heart, but you're saved in front of people by the walk of faith. They can see your faith because God looks on the heart, man looks on the outward appearance. This is why God left us here to walk in faith, and that faith become a type of our evangelism toward the world. What we preach and what we do is seen by the world. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've gone down through the faith of Abraham. We were going to take a break now in this particular lesson and go to Sarah. Then we're going to come back to Abraham and Isaac and talk about their faith, how that they walked it out in front of people. And so let's go to verse 11. That's where we are today. And while you're going there, I just want to remind you too, I have a website called ministersclub.com. That's one word, ministersclub.com. And on that is all the stuff I have is free. I mean, this is ministerial stuff. It's downloads, it's uh, printed lessons, things that you can have to be a great blessing to you. And of course, I want to remind you of that. So not only if you're a pastor or an evangelist or whatever, if you're if you're a Sunday school teacher and you're putting classes together for a class and then and again lessons for a class, then this will be a great help to you. And again, it's just my gift to you, and so I trust that you'll really enjoy it. And I just want to thank you for your gifts to me, and that is again by your prayer, standing with me, but also by your financial support. Thank you so much. And uh, I also have a place on the website. If you'll go to my website, bobyandian.com, there's a place where you can become a partner with me. And partners are really what makes it happen. Jesus had to partners with him called the disciples. They fled, forsook him at the end, but then uh, John came back and then eventually all of them, except of course for Judas, came back and they followed after him. And Jesus had this group and he even was with them up until the time he left. And Jesus also had a group of women that supported him in the ministry. And of course, this is brought out in the four gospels about this group of women that did so. Even their names were mentioned, wives of so-and-so, some were wealthy, some were not, but whatever they gave was appreciated in the ministry. I thank you also for the offerings, not just for the size of them. Any size is fine because God throws it all together. And honestly, if you gave one big offering, you still couldn't match all the ones who give in there and the totals that come from that. Again, I'm thankful for small offerings, big offerings, whatever you can do, that's fine with me and it's fine with God. And again, I thank you for it. If you'd like to become a partner, again, go to bobyandian.com. There's a place on there where you can join me as a partner. Verse 11 says this, through faith, And uh, your King James might say by faith or whatever, but anyway, it's through faith. Also, Sarah received strength. This is also along with Abraham, her husband. She received strength. And the Greek word here is dunamis, which is the physical power or the physical ability to conceive. 
And the word conceive, I think it's an interesting word, is katabalo, and the word means to deposit. And so she received a deposit of seed, and the Greek word for seed is the word spermos, where we get sperm. In other words, up until this time, he couldn't deliver the sperm, she could not conceive and keep it. And they were both past the age. It was impossible for them to have children. But by faith, she switched in her life to a life of faith, just like Abraham did. Abraham floundered for some time. She floundered even longer. She held grudges. She wanted to rule the roost. And the whole thing came back to, it wasn't what God said. He didn't follow what God said. She didn't follow what God said until finally he became strong in faith and he received the power to give seed. And she though had to wait a while. And finally she, by submitting to her husband and also submitting to God and his promises, she now had the power to deliver a child, even in their old age. Abraham was a hundred years old. She was 90 at the time this child was born, and again, they must have had, I mean, there must have been a strange uh, thing among all their friends whenever they would tell them this. But anyway, it says she was delivered of a child in verse 11 when she was past age or the proper time of life because she judged or concluded God faithful who had promised. She finally came to the point where it's so simple, but she just simply said, okay, you promised it. I can't make it happen. And Abraham tried by works to get it done. I mean, he went off to Egypt in a time of difficulty. In Canaan, God never said run away. He said he'd supply for them. Yet in the midst of problems, he ran off to Egypt with his wife and brought back little Egypt with him. And of course, this was the house made that caused the, you know, the, that caused the birth of Ishmael, all that. And so again, we have that there, Hagar. He brought back, I'd like to think, you know, that he brought help with him all the time, brought his father as far as he could, because his father was like the ace in the hole, you know, that if everything went wrong, his father had money. He tried everything he could. God said this, okay, but I'm going to add this to it. And faith is simply trusting God without your addition to it. God doesn't need your works, your desires, your attitude, or your ideas added to his word. In other words, at the cross, Jesus picked up the tab. We can't even pay the tip. And so, and all this is found. She la- Actually, we find with Sarah that whenever God promised it, in the background, she laughed. And we're told this in Genesis chapter 17, verse 17, and also chapter 18, verse 12. And so that's why they named him Isaac. Isaac means laughter. And God just basically said, I'm going to name him after your attitude whenever that you first heard the promise. So she laughed at God's promise. After trying earlier to cause God's promise to come to pass through Hagar, it was her idea to bring Hagar into the house. And to have sexual relations with Abraham, this is Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, this brought out Ishmael and the Arabs today. Sarah was rebellious. In fact, her name before faith was uh, uh, applied in her life was Sarai. And the word Sarai means contentious, and she was contentious. The day she finally submitted to Abraham and said, okay, Abraham, I look at you as the head of this family. I look at God as the head of both of us. I look at you as the leader of the home. The moment she opened up her heart, her womb was opened up and her name was changed to Sarah, which means a princess. She was contentious because of the many years of being barren. She eventually became Sarah, again, meaning princess. This came about through her submission to the plan of God and also to her husband, Abraham. And this is distinctly told us in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 6. She was always dominating. She was nagging Abraham and she eventually called him Lord and advanced strongly in faith from that time on. Lord doesn't mean he is the Lord she served like in heaven. It just simply meant in this natural life, she accepted him as the leader of the home. So eventually she called him Lord and advanced strongly in faith from that time on. Submission to the husband is the first step for a woman to become a faith hero. Sarah's faith is also mentioned in Isaiah chapter 51, verses one and two. And there Isaiah mentioned it as a model, an example to follow. And in the New Testament again, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 6, the production of her faith to bring forth a spiritual nation in Isaac is told in Romans chapter 4 and verse 19 and Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 9. She not only, I mean, we read about her back then, but don't realize how many times in scripture she has used as a model for wives and model for women to look to, to understand contention doesn't bring anything. It seems like more and more we see contentious women in society. We see contentious women in churches because this is the way society is going in rebellion. I'm here to tell you simply, 
that the husband is not the head of the home because he's superior to the woman. No, we're told in the book of Timothy, he is the leader of the home because he was the first one created. And then she was created later. So he became, if it had been flipped the other way around and she'd have been made first, she'd be the leader of the home. But he was made first and she was made second and therefore he becomes the leader of the home. It's not the fact that he was superior to Sarah. No, Abraham was not superior. She was superior in many other areas, in, intellectually, in, 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 in talents and gifts and things like that. Men and women complement each other. And the point of it is there's equality in worth, but there's hierarchy in function. You have to have hierarchy in function, even among the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is in submission to Jesus Christ and to the Father. Jesus Christ is in submission to the Father. The Father is seen as the head of the of the. Uh, of the Godhead. And so again, sexual organs within Sarah were revived when she was 89 years old and a year later she had a child. And by the Lord, and the Lord uh, actually healed her and, and recreated her, her uh, sexual organs so she could conceive Isaac. This was accomplished by the power of God through her faith. When she finally outwardly submitted to the will of God and submitted in the family to her husband, all of a sudden, everything was open in her and she became so peaceful. And she again became a great mother for Isaac. This strength came first into her heart and then brought a miracle into her body. This is exactly how faith works. Faith overflows from the inward man to the outward man. Genesis chapter 17 verses one through nine is the story of God's promise to Abraham for Isaac to be born to Sarah. And at 89 years old, Sarah was given the ability to have a child. She'd never been able to have children at all. She was barren before menopause. So she was bitter about herself, took on her anger upon Abraham. She never took Abraham's authority in the home. Her name Sarai again was contentious, but her change of attitude toward the Lord brought the change in her body. Her change toward God brought a change toward Abraham and Isaac was the result. You know, oftentimes we don't see it, but just as our attitude that keeps faith from working is we talk about believing God, but inside we're filled with contentions. We argue about everything and this is what was causing it not to work in her life. This was Sarah's action of faith. Remember again, this is not faith in the heart to be saved. She was already saved. And so in those verses, she finally believed God's word, concluded God to be faithful to his word. This was simple faith that God had promised her a child and she was going to take him at his word. Abraham was already persuaded that God was faithful. This is Romans chapter four and verse 21. And Sarah followed his example later because God promises something doesn't mean it's gonna, it's gonna immediately come to pass. It doesn't mean it even will come to pass. We must cooperate. Believing is a simple act of faith. This is what this chapter is dedicated to. Simple faith in God's promise after salvation to deliver us, to, to set us on high, to give us authority over Satan. And so when she finally believed his promise and counted him faithful to perform the promise, this is what changed her around and will change us around too. This is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 24. The announcer is going to tell you how you can, you can have copies of these that are here on my desk. I know it's going to be a blessing to you. I will see you after the break. The first Hebrew believers turned Jerusalem and the world upside down. But in 70 short years, they had become bogged down in legalism by mixing Judaism and Mosaic law with their faith. This tainted doctrine crept into the rest of the church and provoked Paul to respond with an intricate and astounding revelation of Jesus Christ. In this New Testament commentary on Hebrews, Bob Yandian employs historic biblical detail and subtleties in the original Greek to dissect Paul's brilliant argument for the superiority of Jesus Christ, the mature believer's walk, the reality of authority, and the importance of faith. To order this New Testament commentary on Hebrews, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Faith without corresponding action is useless and dead. When a believer walks in faith with actions corresponding to their faith, they affect the world for God. What each of us does with our faith will affect future generations. Hebrews 11 describes the faith of some of God's heroes of faith and how they impacted future generations, even up to our own. In these 15 messages from Hebrews, Pastor Bob Yandian will encourage and inspire you to become one of God's heroes of faith. To order The Heroes of Faith, 
visit our website at bobbyendian.com. Bobby Endian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Pastors, if you would like to schedule Bob Yandian to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to bobyandian.com forward slash invite. Continuing on with the faith of Sarah, let's go on to verse 12 here in Hebrews chapter 11. And verse 12 says, Therefore, as a result, sprang or was born there even from one man, that's Abraham, and even from him Abraham as good who was dead. This is sexually dead. So many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sands of the sea shore innumerable. What's this verse saying? From Abraham and from Sarah came two sets of offspring, which they didn't get to see. They only saw one child born and then, you know, and then Abraham again later on remarried after Sarah died and he had a women, uh, through the women that he married there, uh, he had children, but they were not part of this, what God was talking about. From Abraham and Sarah came two sets of offspring, a natural race called the sands of the sea, that is the Jewish nation, and then a spiritual race called the stars of the heavens. And just as the heavens are there, the sand down here, there was a natural race and a spiritual race. And the spiritual race is from every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation, because he said to Abraham, and you shall all nations be blessed. And those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, or Jehovah, they called him in the Old Testament, they're the ones who became the stars of the heavens. And the sand of the sea was that natural race. But Jesus Christ came from both. He was born a physical Jew. And of course, he was the son of God. And Jesus Christ is responsible for, uh, he is the seed of Abraham that was spoken to him back in chapter 12 of the book of Genesis when God said, in your seed shall all nations be blessed. And that's us too, because we as Gentiles can receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And Jesus hooks us up to that spiritual race that came from Abraham to where not only can the physical Jew call him the father, we can call him the father of our faith. And that's the great thing of it. So from this verse of scripture, it says that sprang forth from her and from Abraham, Abraham, who was as good as dead. In the previous verse, we found out she was as good as dead. Neither one could have uh, children. When Sarah got in line with God and Abraham got in line with God, Isaac was the result. Abraham could have sex as much as a dead man, and she could get pregnant as much as a dead woman. God raised his sexual ability from the dead. Abraham had already believed God and his sexual strength had been renewed. It was later that Sarah believed God's word. Ishmael was born between these two times. The second half of this verse is a quote from Genesis chapter 15 and verse 5 and chapter 22 and verse 17, and chapter 32 and verse 12 of Genesis, the one about the fact that from you was going to come a race, a natural race is the sand of the sea, and a spiritual race like the stars of heaven. And so again, we see those two coming from him. Abraham didn't live long enough to see these things blossom. He didn't live long enough to see the the Jewish race, even on this earth, blossom and more and more and more uh, born. He saw some that were born, but again, from that time on, we find that, again, he didn't see the fulfillment of that. We're seeing still the fulfillment of that happening today as the Jewish nation is protected as a physical nation, but also every kindred, tribe, tongue, and, and nation giving their allegiance and faith to the Lord Jesus Christ who came from Israel, who was born out of that seed of Israel, and again was the key to the whole spiritual race that started from Abraham, the stars of the heaven. From sexual death came two supernatural races, the Jewish nation and a race of believers who put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Out of death has come a numberless multitude of believers, a spiritual race of all nations. The stars represent the race through Jesus Christ, a heavenly race, and again includes all kindred, tribe, and time, all nations. The sand represents the natural race on earth, the Jewish nation. In verses 13 through 16 of this chapter, uh, here in chapter 11 of Hebrews, the heroes of faith, we're going to take a look at verses 13 through 16. Faith's answers are are not always seen on earth while we live. Eventually it will be by other people after us. But again, verse 13 starts us out saying, these all, these all are the believers we have studied up until now. All the way back there from 
from Cain and Abel, and Abel being the one that was killed and, and his brother killing him. But again, from the time he died and all the way down to here, Abraham and Sarah, this verse says, these all, that is the believers up to Sarah and Abraham, died in faith, not having received the promises but having seen them from afar off or from a distance and were promised of them and embraced them and confessed or acknowledged them that they were strangers and pilgrims or transients in this earth. This whole time they lived, they saw it at a distance, but never got to get there. They died before that happened. They lived their lives as strangers and pilgrims, transients. I told you that Abraham, his entire life and Isaac and Jacob, their entire life lived in tents and they're now looking for a city that has a foundation because tents don't have a foundation. They simply have pegs you put in the ground, you move to another place, put pegs in the ground, and we're finally, they say, it wasn't until after they died, they found the foundation they were looking for in a home, and you and I are the same way. I don't care if we have a natural home in this earth and build it, again, God has one for us in heaven that has a true foundation, and it will never rot, never decay. That's the home we're looking forward to. Or as Jesus said, behold, I'm going to build mansions for you. I go to my heavenly Father and there's a mansion prepared for you. Faith doesn't stop at death, but for the mature believer, it is the end of being a doer of God's word here in this earth. In other words, there's an end to our faith when we get born again. The second we're born again, that has happened. It's eternal. From that point on through the rest of our life, we live the walk of faith, and the walk of faith doesn't come to an end until we die, and that's called being a doer of God's word. Faith isn't just used to stay alive in Satan's world. It's also used at the time of death, which gives God glory. And in that verse of scripture, they gave God glory that even though they didn't see with their physical eye what God promised to them, they still knew it was coming and they got to see the beginning of it. I mean, even Noah, when he got out of the ark, that wasn't the end of it. God promised him that after him, the earth would continue going on, population would come, but he didn't get to see that. But you know what? He simply died in faith, knowing that God would keep his word. So again, looking with confidence of our entrance into heaven, God causes God's name to be magnified and leaves a lasting testimony on this earth. Dying, in essence, is better than living. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21. We are told in these verses of scripture over and over again that to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Going to heaven is far better. And it says even in, in the book of Corinthians that if all we have is hope in this life, we are of all men most miserable. I've heard people say, you know, even if heaven wasn't promised to me, this is wonderful down here. No, it's not, not compared to eternity. The Bible said that's a wrong view altogether. We ought to look at life as, listen, this is great, but you know what? I'm transient. I'm moving through here and the best is yet to come. This is a drop in the bucket compared to what God has for me when I arrive in heaven. And I'm looking forward to that one day. I, if I don't live long enough to see the rapture of the church, Jesus coming back for his church, taking us to heaven, I'm going to go by way of death. But again, on this side is, is this life, and on that side is eternal life with God in heaven. Physically, I'll even have a resurrection body one day that will be in heaven with Jesus Christ forever and forever and all the saints that are there. Many of these heroes were promised blessing, which they never saw in their lifetime. Abraham was promised two races, offspring, which he never got to see the sum total of or even the growth of it much. Enoch saw the flood and the second advent of the Lord coming through God's promises, but never did he see it in his lifetime. He died before the flood came, and he certainly died before the second coming of Jesus into this earth. What did they not see in life that they saw in death? Death was handled through the same faith they used to live on earth. This is the eye of faith, 2 Corinthians 4.18, which gets clearer every day. The vision of God's word increases our spiritual vision every day, even though we can physically see with our eye that the world is going downhill every single day. Even though the world is getting worse, we're getting better as the body of Christ. This is the future we see during the time period we live. This is our acceptance of the integrity of God's promises. All of God's promises are as real as God is, and that was found back in chapter 6 of this verse, that we understand faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I can't see the physical manifestation of it yet, but the promise is my guarantee it's on the way. The promise is real. That is, again, that is the the uh, 
title deed we have to our healing, to the blessings we're waiting for. I may not have the money in my hand right now that I'm trusting God for, even though I look around and my natural needs are still the same, if not worse. I still need food. In fact, I need food worse than I did two days ago. And the money I have in the bank is going down. I can look at all those things with the natural eye, but with the spiritual eye, God promised me he'll supply all of my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. You know what that means? That's my title deed. And the title deed is like actually owning the home. Even if I bought a house I'd never seen, if I had the title deed in my hand, that means that house belongs to me. You couldn't argue me out of it. So why should we get argued out of our healing? Why should we get argued out of God supplying finances for it? Just because we can't see it with this eye. In the word of God, we have the promised deed. We have the title deed to what God has promised us. This is why those Old Testament heroes chose to travel in tents, show the fact that they were strong strangers and wanderers in this earth. When we were sinners, we were strangers and transients from God's kingdom. This is Ephesians chapter one, verse 11, 12, and 19. It tells us there, we were strangers from the covenants of promises. Now that we have changed citizenships, Philippians 3, 20, now I'm a citizen of heaven. I switched citizenships the moment I got born again. I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. I changed citizenships, and right now I am a stranger and a pilgrim here, and my citizenship was transferred to heaven. This is the patriarchs that did this. And so we are here and we're only here temporarily. Verse 14 of this chapter says, for they that say or declare such things declare plainly that they seek a country. I can tell you this, I am here to tell you, I seek a country. Right down here, I am a stranger and a pilgrim. I'll only be here for a while, but I'm headed toward heaven. And so this is the patriarchs. They declared they were strangers, pilgrims. It's not these heroes that not only don't have a citizenship, they do. They don't have a citizenship on earth anymore. They have a citizenship in heaven. The moment they received the Lord as their savior, they looked for heaven also. They went to a place under the earth called paradise, which was a waiting place for heaven. But at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his ascension into heaven, they have now gone there. Their home country changed to heaven while they were on earth. Suddenly they were a stranger on earth headed for a new country called heaven. This is now your home country, heaven is, for which you head for and strive to see through the eye of faith. And this was the essence of verse 10 back there earlier. You and I have a home we're looking forward to in heaven. I've attended so many funerals lately. The older I get, I go to more funerals. But I can tell you, every one of them, if they're older people in the Lord, we rejoice for them. There's not that much sorrow in it. We sorrow because we're going to miss them. But man, by the time they turn 70, 80 or older, They've already got, they've gone to heaven. The whole point is, man, one day we will get to be too. And we'll be up there rejoicing around the throne of God with them. This is the greatness we have as Christians. This is the greatness you have as a Christian, knowing that Jesus Christ has made all this up for us. And in the meantime, as far as God's concerned, I'm already there. He sees me there. I'm already seated with Jesus in heavenly places. You say, no, you're down here. No, I see it through the eye of faith. And that is my title deed to the fact I'm in heaven. I belong there and I will live there forever. So find out again about these. You can order these, but also again, the announcer's going to tell you how, again, you can become part of this ministry. Thank you for being here. I will see you tomorrow. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.